afternoon. Can everybody hear me? I can hear you well. Great, thanks. Uh, so, dear audience, um, I welcome you to today's public lecture series. Um, as Gertie Koppel is connected via mobile phone and therefore some technical difficulties, I will take over today. And I also welcome Moritz Grosse Ventrup from the University of Vienna. And for his topic today about, um, I can't see your slides anymore, Moritz. No, you should be able to see them uh, again. Perfect, yeah. About sustainability in explainable AI. So the floor okay, is yours, you, Moritz. Thank you very much for the introduction. Can you understand me well? Yes. Wonderful, good. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today. So to begin with, I would like to thank Gerti very much for organizing the wonderful lecture series. I'm very much looking forward to this uh, lecture and the discussions. Uh, that being said, I would like to emphasize the discussions. So I really like the discussions and I like interactive lectures. Uh, of course, we all know from our time, the pandemic, that doing this online and having something that is very interactive online is a challenge but I would try nonetheless. So I have the chat open here on my window and I would very much encourage all of you to make use of the chat and ask any questions that you may have. Feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I do have enough slides to cover more than 45 or 60 minutes, but I don't need to make it through those slides. So if we are having a lively discussion, uh, I would actually prefer not to finish my slides and have a more lively discussion. So please help me out a little bit on that. So with that introduction, um, let me introduce myself. Uh, so uh, I am Moritz Rosaventrup, I'm head of the research group Neuroinformatics. And I guess the first question that pops up then is what has neuroinformatics to do with explainable AI? And what has explainable AI to do with sustainability? So let me begin with the first part. So in our research group in informatics, we study um, biological systems. We try to understand how biological systems um, generate movement and cognition. And for that, we use computer science tools. And now what does that have to do with explainable AI? So the wonderful thing is that in the past 10 years or so, or 15 years, we finally have been able to build computer systems, AI systems that can do cognitively interesting tasks, like the large language models yeah, are wonderful at generating complex language. So now for the very first time in really the history of humanity, we have a way to build models, AI models, that can mimic behavior of humans. That is really interesting. And if you look at more the history of neuroinformatics or computational neuroscience, then the models that we have built in the past have been rather simple. They have um, been very abstract and have maybe captured some principal organizational features of the system that we study. But in the past, we had no system, no model, neuronal model that could do image recognition on a large scale or complex reasoning or playing chess or Go. And now finally, we have these models and we can then use these models uh, to um, train them, to reproduce behavior of neuronal systems, of maybe simple model organisms or maybe complex human behavior, and then try to understand how these models have learned to achieve these tasks. And that means that we have now you know, a model that has modeled a biological system. And now we would like to understand how that model actually achieves that goal. So we'd like to open the black box and peek into the model. And from that, learn how biological systems learn to do accomplish certain cognitively interesting tasks. So that is kind of our interest in AI and why we use AI in general, in particular, our interest in explainable AI, because we want to understand how these models model biological systems. Now, what has that all to do with sustainability? Well, explainable AI is, of course, not only interesting to scientists who wish to understand complex systems, but explainable AI is also very important because nowadays we have many situations where AI agents 
algorithms in general make decisions about or make decisions that affect people's lives. For instance, a widespread application is loan approval. If you apply for a loan and you enter certain information uh, into a system, then there's a, there's a good chance that there will be some AI algorithm in the background that uh, decides um, whether you are eligible for this loan or not. And now the question is, is that, is that okay? Yeah? Do we as a society are okay with um, AI systems making decisions that affect us in our everyday lives? And now uh, probably some of you have heard about the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation uh, 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 Framework that stipulates that uh, subjects should have a right to obtain an explanation of the decision reach. So an explanation of the decision that an algorithm or an AI system has made that affects you and to challenge that decision. So these are two very important rights that are enshrined in the GDPR. But now the question is, what is an explanation? And how can you challenge a decision? And so if you think about it, this becomes pretty complex. And I want to start here by uh, giving one example that kind of illustrates the intricacies and the implications that, that these two rights have. So if I may ask, who has heard about this? Who has heard about the COMPASS system, the Correctional Offender Mutual Law Alternative Sanction Long Title? So if you've heard about it in the chat, uh, if you heard about it already, could you please uh, briefly indicate so in the chat? Nobody. I'm not really surprised. So what is it? The Correctional Offender Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions, or COMPASS system, is a case management and decision support tool developed and owned by North Point, used by US courts to assess the likelihood of a defendant becoming a recidivist. COMPASS has been used by the US states of New York, Wisconsin, California, Florida, Broad County, and other jurisdictions. So this is from Wikipedia. What does this mean yeah, in simple language? It means that if there is a um, person accused of a crime in court, this person fills out a questionnaire. And this questionnaire has 137 items and covers a large range of prior crimes, socioeconomic circumstances or conditions that the person lives in and so on. And based on this 137 item questionnaire, this compass system assigns a score between one and 10. And this score is an estimate of how likely that person who's accused of a crime is likely to commit another crime in the future. So a score of 10 means that the system judges that person to be very likely to commit another crime. And a score of one uh, is the person is very unlikely to commit another crime in the future. And these decisions or these predictions that this system makes, they can be used by the judge um, in finding the right in quotation marks, sentence for this person. So individuals can be and probably are directly affected by the predictions that this system makes. And now, of course, that raises a few questions. And there's a very long and interesting article in a poor publica from 2016 already entitled Machine Bias that says there's software used across the country to predict future criminals and it's biased against blacks. So what this article found is that when you look at people who have been predicted by the system to commit another crime, but who did not commit another crime within a period of three years, then these people are predominantly um, of dark skin color and not of the bright skin color. And hence this article that there's a bias, um, that this machine is biased against black people. Now, you might ask, why is that machine even allowed this compass system to use skin color? And in fact, it's not. This 137 questionnaire, uh, item questionnaire has a lot of, of items about the living conditions of people, but of course, skin color is not part of that questionnaire. So somehow the system makes use of other features that result in it being biased against black people. And now, of course, a relevant question is, how does that happen? How does that come about? Can we peek into that model and understand how that bias comes about? And actually, it's even more complicated because the Washington Post, that is also a very liberal newspaper, found 
or wrote another article in response that said a computer program used for bail and sentence and decisions was labeled biased against blacks. But it's actually not that clear because when they looked at um, the predictions of um, people committing another crime who actually did commit another crime, then the um, prediction accuracy was uh, similar for white uh, and black people. So it seems to be complex. And somehow we need to peek into these black box machine learning models to understand why they make certain decisions. And of course, if we want AI algorithms to be sustainable, to be accepted in the general public, then it is very important to understand how they make decisions to ensure that these decisions are fair and that these decisions are transparent to build trust in such systems in the society or also to decide as a society that for certain applications, we do not want algorithmic decision-making AI models to be used. So this concludes the introduction. And now I would ask for the first time, do you have any questions? Please do post them in the chat. So I don't see any questions right now. Maybe some of you are typing. Yeah, I will continue, but if you type a question, please do continue. And I will turn to the question as soon as I see it. Okay, so now, how do we peek into this black box model? Yeah, first of all, for that, I need to talk a little bit about machine learning and AI and what that actually is and how decisions are being formed. So we need to go a little bit into the math of machine learning. So I have one slide on machine learning. So, um, again, something for the chat. Could you please briefly indicate or write yes if you already had a machine learning lecture so that I roughly know how many people of you have experience in machine learning? These are quite a few. Okay, thank you. So I would say roughly a third, it seems, have experience with machine learning. But thank you. So I do a brief review info. Of course, I can't do a comprehensive review of machine learning uh, in, in, a, in a lecture that is about um, explaining the AI. But I try to highlight the most important um, concepts to understand uh, what follows. So in machine learning, we have a set of features. And we collect these features in a so-called feature vector x. And here, this would be a vector that contains D elements. Yeah? And each one of these D elements could be one questionnaire. Yeah? And so imagine that uh, one X here is one subject, and yeah, one, one, one subject that the compass system makes the prediction on. And then each one of these D features would be one question. Yeah? So how many crimes have you committed before might be the first question. The second question could be, have you ever been in jail or not? The third question could be, how many siblings do you have? The fourth question could be, how old are you? And so on. Those would be D questions. You know, so every subject would be categorized, but not categorized, but operationalized, kind of represented by this D-dimensional so-called feature vector. Um, yeah, there's one question in the chat. How much is it needed to trust in an AI exactly to achieve the goal to be sustainable? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very complex question. And I would say that's, that's for society to decide in the end. Right? I mean, we as computer scientists, we can build the tools to render AI systems explainable, and we can build the AI tools. And we can maybe also, and maybe we should, inform the governments about these tools that are available and the challenges. But ultimately, I believe that a society must be informed by scientists to reach a decision um, when and in which settings AI systems are allowed to be deployed and when they should not be used. Okay, so let me continue. Now I'm going to make a distinction that is usually not made in machine learning, but that I find very relevant. We have this feature vector here, X. And now I'm going to introduce the same feature vector X again, but with this hat. And that hat means that these are now the measurements of the true underlying features. And this is not necessarily the same thing. Now, so there might be true features, 
So the real values, say the real number of times that a person already uh, was in jail, the real number of siblings and so on, but they do not need to coincide with the actual measurements of these items for various reasons. So it could be that some person just misremembers something when filling out a questionnaire. It could be that a person intentionally lies about an item in the questionnaire. So the measurements of these features do not need to coincide with the actual features. They are just measurements. And I will return to this important distinction later. And then we have certain labels that we're going to predict and we call these labels Y. And in the simplest case, these are just binary labels, zero or one. And in our case, zero could stand for a decision of the system or a prediction that a subject will not commit another crime. And one could stand for the decision that the subject is likely to commit another crime. And these are the outputs that we want to predict. And so what we want to do, we want to take functions, a function H that we call a hypothesis. And we want to uh, these functions, this hypothesis, to take a feature vector x and output a label. And now we have a group of hypotheses to begin with. Yeah, so for instance, if you train a deep neural network, then each one of these hypotheses would be one particular instantiation of a neural network with a certain structure and a certain weight. And from all of these hypotheses that we consider, all of those models we consider, we want to choose that age that minimizes our loss function. So the loss function, for instance, could be the prediction accuracy that our um, classifier age makes on the features when predicting these labels. And we are going to choose our, loss, uh, our best classifier based on a training set S. Yeah, so we will receive or usually receive pairs of features and labels. Yeah, so each pair here would be one subject. And the label would be then a few years later whether the subject committed another crime or not. And particularly, or we say we have n of these samples that are drawn from some underlying distribution, joint distribution of y and x. And this is the data that we train our classifier on. That means we choose that hypothesis, that classifier, that minimizes this loss, say the prediction error, on the training set that we have. And this algorithm is called empirical risk minimization. It's a learning concept of a learning algorithm. And it returns a hypothesis that hopefully is the best hypothesis. Now, for the rest of the talk, I will assume that indeed this learning procedure found the best possible prediction model. And things get a lot more complicated if we actually allow that our machine learning procedure may only have found a good, but not necessarily the best hypothesis or the best model in the case. And then if we have this model, you know, we can take a new feature vector, like a new sample, a new subject, plug that questionnaire in and get a prediction. And then I want to do one important distinction. We can now ask what happens if we change certain aspects of the feature vector. Now, so I'm going to represent this with this do operator that I'm going to talk about a bit more later on. This do operator represents intervention where we set the feature vector to a certain value. And we distinguish between interventions that we do on the data, so on the measurements that we feed into the model, and interventions that we do on, sorry, these are the measurements, the intervention on the, on the measurements, and interventions that we actually do on the real underlying the features. Yeah. So that is a distinction. We can kind of play around with the data that we have stored on our computer and change these and see what the model does. Or we can try to implement interventions in the real world and maybe give some training to a subject to help them to, I don't know, get a higher high school degree or something like that. Okay, so if you have questions about this, this kind of primer, this notation, please post in the chat and I will quickly read the next question in the chat in the meantime. So the question is, can the assisting AI also predict the accused person now spends excess in prison if that lowers or increases the likability of the person committing uh, the probability of the person committing another crime? This sounds like a psychopath. Anyway, he's in aim series. I'm not aware of any of such system. Yeah. Um, who knows? Yeah, if there's something like that out there. This compass system, as far as I know, does not do that. 
Okay, further questions? Okay, then let's uh, talk about the question, how do we actually take a peek into the model? Yeah. And I will introduce one rather simple um, way to peek into the model as one example, and then I will generalize a bit from that. So one of the most simple things that you can do is the so-called permutation feature importance score. And the basic intuition idea behind that score is that you try to assess for each individual feature, so in our running example, for each individual item in this questionnaire, how much that item contributes to model performance. So essentially, you want to know how good is the model with that item and how good is the model without that item. And then you compare the two values, and that is your feature importance. For instance, you could say, um, I want to know whether age is an important predictor. So I'm going to look at the prediction accuracy of that model with age included. And then I take the variable age away. I make the variable age uninformative. I will say in a minute how we do that. And then you look at the performance again. And maybe if your performance, your classification accuracy drops by 5%, then you say, okay, 5% is now the weight, the importance that I assign, I assign to the feature age. And in this way, you can go through all the variables that you use for the prediction model and compute how relevant, how important um, each of these features is. And what I just explained is kind of written mathematically. So this is the loss. So say the classification accuracy that the best hypothesis has when you give it the true features and labels. And you compare this loss with the loss where you don't give it the true features, but from the true features, say from this 137 questionnaires, you remove the i feature and replace it by a different version, by this tilde version. And how actually do you do that? What you do is you randomly permute these, um, this item here. And so from all of those data that you have from all those, say, if you want to know whether age is relevant and X I would be now the age of a subject, you would take the age of all your subjects in your training set and you randomly shuffle them. And what you achieve that by doing that is that the age is still distributed according to the true distribution in the data set because the marginal distribution does not change but just shuffling the data. But you have made sure that this new shuffled variable is independent of all other features and of the labels because you have randomly shuffled it. So by construction, there is no relationship anymore between that feature and the labels and the other features. And then you compute the loss again with the shuffled version. And that gives you your permutation feature importance score. And I've shown you a very simple example where this was applied to the so-called bike data set, a standard data set that people like to use in evaluating feature importance scores. And that is a problem where you try to predict based on the temperature, wind speed, season, humidity, weekday, working day, holiday, whether it's a working holiday, whether people are going likely to rent out the bike. And then you find here in the setting that where well, temperature seems to be really relevant for predicting whether a subject wants to rent the bike, the wind speed also a little bit, working day or holiday supplies you not even that much. And this is one of the most standard, easiest ways you can kind of try peeking into the model. But obviously, it's a bit of a limited way to peek into the model. Because imagine you apply this to the compass system, and you then get a feature importance score. That won't tell you yet why that system is biased against Black people. Now, that's somehow, there's something more complex going on. And in this model here, you only look at the relevance of each feature individually. But not really in, in conjunction with other features. And also, you don't really look at how relevant a feature is for each individual prediction. And so maybe some people base their decision whether they want to rent a bike on the temperature. Maybe others base it on whether they have a holiday or not. And this is not represented here, just like this global average, whether across all the subjects in your training set, a feature is relevant or not. So. Um, there are different ways to look at data, not surprisingly, and there's this whole zoo of explainable AI methods. And you can categorize this 
along various dimensions. And some of the dimensions that have been chosen here are model agnostic versus model specific, global versus local, post hoc versus intrinsic, and explanation modality. And I briefly want to go into, into these dimensions. So model agnostic versus model specific is quite important. It means now you have a certain model with which you make a prediction. It could be a deep neural network, a random forest, a logistic regression, a classifier, or a support vector machine, whatever. And now the question is, is a um, XAI method, an explainable AI method, applicable only to a certain class of models, say only to deep networks, or only to support vector machines? Or is it something that is generic, that can be in principle be used to peek into any black box model? the difference between model agnostic and model specific. The feature importance score that we discussed in the previous slide would be model agnostic. You can apply that in principle to any type of model. The second distinction is global versus local interpret interpretability. So here you're asking the question, do you want to explain one individual decision? Or do you want to explain on average across all decisions which features are relevant or not? For instance, in our compass example, we could ask, is age in general being used as a feature by that model? Yes or no? How important is it? Or you could ask for one individual subject or for one individual defendant, was the age a relevant factor in the decision that the compass model assigned to that one subject? And that's obviously a very different question. Do you want to explain individual decisions by a model? Or do you want to explain like a generic global importance of certain features. Then you can ask, is a model a post hoc or an intrinsic explainable method? So post hoc would mean that after you have um, trained the model and the model is up and running, can you now use this additional method to open the black box of the model? Now the feature importance score would be a post hoc method and by the way, a global interpretability model. But there are also some methods that are intrinsically explainable. People often say, for instance, that a random forest or a decision tree is constructed in such a sense that you can just look at the structure of the decision tree and infer which items are relevant. And in a sense, that is true, I would say. But if decision trees become very complex, then maybe it's not so easy anymore. Yeah. And then the fourth modality that is uh, being singled out is the explanation modality. So how do you actually explain um, what is relevant? You could explain by feature attribution, as we did in the previous slide. You could also explain by examples and say um, to the user of such a system, look, if this is examples of subjects who are going to be classified as high risk for reoffending again, and these are subjects with low risk. Or you could write an explanatory text or try to learn some more high level concepts. So the more important point behind here is who do you want to explain that to? Is the person to whom you want to explain the decision a machine learning expert, an AI expert? Is that a domain expert, like the judge? Or maybe is that an individual defendant? And I hope it's intuitively plausible that depending on who you want to explain something to, you might have to use very different concepts and very different language. Yeah, so uh, somebody who, who has committed a crime is in court but say has never graduated high school, will need a very different explanation than a machine learning expert who has a PhD in, in, in AI or machine learning. So there's this whole zoo of methods. And an obvious question then is, if you want to use an explainability method, which of all of these hundreds of methods do you actually use? And so there have been surveys done by colleagues who have asked researchers who use explainability methods, which method did you use and why? And the somewhat frustrating answer is that people didn't really know what they should use and why they should use it. And they were often guided by um, popularity of the method. So if a certain method was rather recent, published at a high impact conference and was cited a lot, then people thought, okay, I, should, I should use that. Now yeah? everybody's using that, maybe that's a good idea. But in fact, if you look deeper into it, all of these different methods, they answer different questions. And so what you should be asking yourself as a user of these XAI methods is, what question do I wanna answer? And if you have really determined the question that you want to answer, then maybe 
uh, you can find the best tool for the question at hand. And this is now where I kind of leave the general overview and turn a bit more to our own research on this topic. Because one of the main contributions that we have made in the past years is placing the focus on what is actually the question that you would like to answer. And then I start developing kind of a taxonomy of different questions you might ask in explainable AI. And once you have this taxonomy, you can start developing methods for these individual sub questions. So the next step I'm now going to take is I'm going to explain how we came up with this taxonomy of questions that we can ask in explainable AI. And I'm going to argue that this is at its core a causal problem. So I'm going to introduce a little bit of causality as we go along. But before that, I would like to take a short break again and give you time to um, ask any questions in the chat. Okay, then let me continue. So I'm now going to argue that explainable AI or also interpretable machine learning is a um, causal problem. Ah, no question, but if somebody wants to take a look at the complex question sheet. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much for hosting. Yes, that is the question sheet. So I'm now going to argue that explainable AI or interpretable machine learning, these two terms are used most synonymously, is at its core a causal problem. So let me argue why. Assume that we have these variables, these four variables that we observe, and this target outcome y. So these four variables could be four items in this question. And now we take measurements of these variables. Now we ask our defendant, now how old are you? How many times have you been in jail? How many siblings do you have? What is your income? And so on. But we need to be aware that these questions might only loosely correlate with these uh, true underlying values for various reasons. And now we take these measurements and we feed these measurements into our machine learning model. So we now assume that we have the best machine learning model, and this now takes these, these four items and makes a prediction out of that whether the subject is likely to, um, to commit another crime or not. And now I would like to guide your attention to these arrows here. So these arrows here, they um, represent uh, the structure of our machine learning model in the sense that each one of these measurements causes the output. So they feed into our model. And in general, if I'm going to change these values, and if I'm going to do an intervention on these, maybe I just open my Python notebook and replace x1 by a different value, then this is going to affect, in general, the outcome of the model. So I can do interventions on my computer on these measurements, change them, and see how these changes affect my predicted outcome. However, in the real world, the causal relations between these variables might be very different. It might be, for instance, that in the world, the causal relations between these variables are given by this one, that actually x1 is not causing y at all, but there's some other variable x5 that is a common cause of x1 and why. So for instance, in our example, x1 could be the skin color of a person. x5 could be unobserved socioeconomic factors that both have a relationship or a causal for whether, or maybe maybe x5, let me try to make this more transparent. Um, say maybe x5 is how, how, um, how expensive housing is in a certain area. And um, that if you're likely to live in an area where uh, housing is cheap, then it's likely to be an area with a lot of crime. And if you live there, maybe you are indeed more likely to, uh, uh, to become a criminal. And at the same time, maybe the socioeconomic environment is such that if you live in an area with very low housing costs, then you're also more likely to have a dark skin color. And then this housing cost here would be a common cause of your uh, skin color and the probability of, um, of committing a crime. However, here in our example, I've now assumed that this 
X5, this, this say housing costs, are not observed by the model. And here I've drawn some other features and I've also given them some causes structure here in such a way that X2 causes X3 and X3 directly affects the outcome and also X4 and X4 then affects the outcome again. Yeah, so maybe X2 is the age of a subject and maybe the age has an influence on the income. You know, the, the older you are, the more time you had to build up um, some or save some money. And then maybe the um, amount of money that you have maybe has an effect on the education and training that you have in a job. And maybe all of this affects the outcome. Right? This is just a hypothetical example. But the important point that I want to make here is that this causal structure that exists in the world between those features is in general unknown to the model. The model just takes the measurements and then feeds them into the predictor. And now it should hopefully already be intuitively plausible, and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a minute, that if you now start playing around with these measurements and start changing them, then this is something different from playing around with those true features in the world. There are dependencies here that are induced between these variables that the model here is unaware of. And this causes some problems in the interpretation that I want to get to in a minute. But before I can do that, I need to briefly take a step back and talk about causality and causal reasoning. So if I'm asked you again uh, to type in the chat, yes or no, um, have you already had experience in causality? Have you heard any lecture, seminars, or read about rigorous statistical machine learning frameworks of causality? Yes or no, please. So, so far, I don't see a single yes, and I would have been surprised if there were one. However, um, uh, causality is becoming more and more important in machine learning, and I think we should start teaching about it, but that's another topic for another day. But now let me quickly introduce briefly the main concepts of causality in machine learning. And this is typically based on the framework of structural causal models introduced by Judea Pearl, in his book, Causality, uh, in 2000, and uh, Judea Pearl also won the uh, Turing Award, so the kind of equivalent of the Nobel Prize in Computer Science for his work in causality. And it is not the only causal framework in computer science, but probably the most popular one. And it works as follows. So in such a structural causal model, you have a set of variables, x, y. Right? These could be the items in the questionnaire or the true underlying states of this questionnaire. And now we have a structure causal model which defines each one of these variables as a function of the parents of these variables and some exogenous noise term. And so the parents of this variable are those variables that directly cause this one here. So maybe age is a direct cause of income. Yeah? So if this here would be income, then one of the parents of income could be age. And then for each variable, you have this additional noise term that is not observed, and that kind of drives the whole model. And you, so let me give you one example. You could define a simple structural equation or structural causal model that consists of three variables, x1, x2, and x3. And you could assume that x1 and x2 are independent causes in this setting, and x3 is a function of x1 and x2, and the particular form of the function could just be a product, and then it could be such that you add x13, the noise on top. And then you can represent the structure causal model as a directed acyclic graph. And in this case, we would represent it here with these two arrows that point into x3, because x3 in this example is a function of x1 and of x2. And there are no arrows that point into x1 or into x2 because these two variables here are only driven by the exogenous and independent noise terms. And then you can talk about the data that this model generates. So in order to sample from that model, what you would do is you would specify a distribution over the noise terms, you would draw samples of this distribution, and then plug them into these functions here to first sample x1, then x2, and then x3. 
And then you have generated a sample from this joint distribution X. So we kind of have these three different levels here. We have the level of the structural causal model that kind of describes how reality works, the causal relations that live out there in the world. We have the representation of the structure as a directed acyclic graph, which tells us which variables are causes of one another, but doesn't tell us how the specific functional forms here of these variables look like. And then we have the data that these structure causal models generate. And now the central problem in causality is that we can observe this data, but we usually don't know the structure, the causal structure that generated the data. And we usually don't know the exact functional forms that kind of live here on these edges. And the goal of causal inference is to move from the data to the DAG and the structural model. So kind of when you see it as how does the world generate data, we assume there is such a structural causal model that describes the true causal relationships between the variables that we are currently considering. We can represent that as a DAG, and the world then throws data at us. Our goal in causal inference is to move the other way around and to try to reconstruct or infer from the data the structure of the graph, or ideally even the functional forms that govern our data. Now, why is that so useful to do that? Let me give you an example of that. So imagine that we have these four variables, and imagine that we know that this is the causal structure. For some reason, we have found out that this is the causal structure in the world. Now, what we can do is we can factorize the joint distribution that we can observe from or infer from data according to this causal structure. And so we can always write this joint distribution of the data using Bayes' theorem in many different ways. But there's one specific factorization that corresponds to the structure of this causal graph. In this example, it would be the probability of x2 conditioned on x1, x3, and x4, because x2 is an effect of x1, x3, and x4 then times the probability of x1 conditional on x4, because x1 only depends on x4, times the probability of x3 conditioned on x4, because x3 only depends on x4, and then the probability of x4, the marginal one, because x4 is the root node in this graph. There's nothing in this graph that causes x4. And if we have this factorization, what we can then do is we can predict the effect of interventions, and this is really amazing. So we can say, we can ask, what happens if we now intervene in the real world on x1, and if we change x1? So what we're doing there, we are removing that link from x4 to x1, because now we set x1 to a certain value, and hence make it independent of what happened with x4. And we can write that intervention distribution, right, the distribution of all the other variables, given this intervention that we set the variable x1 to a certain value, by simply taking this factorization and plugging in x1 wherever we see for the condition on x1. So that means that we now can predict the effect of interventions only from the knowledge of the joint distribution, which we can infer from data, and the knowledge of this causal graph. That is what makes this framework so powerful. Now, I would like to talk a little bit about how we can actually infer these graphs only from data, but I don't think I have really time for that because I have already spoken to for almost 45 minutes and I still want to get to the essence of the, um, the, the interpretability talk and have time for questions. So I'm going to um, quickly uh, go over that. If you're interested, take a look at the book Causality by Judea Pearl. And there's also a more introductory textbook by Judea Pearl called a causal inference, or, or I think it's called a primer in causal inference. Um, and that's a very good introductory text. This causality book is, is heavy reading. Okay, so now let me go to our problem here. So now equipped with this reasoning or with this knowledge about what causal relations or how they are represented in the X, uh, let us see now um, some of the difficulties that arise in interpreting machine learning models from distinguishing between the data level model, the measurements, 
and the true model, the world. So for instance. So let's take a look at y, at our outcome variable, and x2. Conditional on x3. And so we're asking the outcome and x2, do these two share information or are they statistically independent given x3? And here in our uh, true world model, um, we actually have that x2 does not provide any information to the model that is not going through x3. So if the model knows x3, this one here, that kind of blocks the path from x2 to y. So whatever happens in x2 is irrelevant to the model. An optimal prediction model that is trained on this causal structure will not make use of x2. It will assign zero importance to x2 because if it knows x3, then it already knows everything that happened at x2 that is relevant for y. Or in other words, x3 blocks the path from x2 to y. So we would find here in this model, if we analyze the model, that x2 is an irrelevant feature. The model doesn't need it. But if we actually test for a correlation between our predicted scores and x2, we would find a correlation between the two. We would find the two to be dependent because, well, x2 has an influence on x3, x3 is being used, and x3 has an influence on y. So via x3, an influence or a, a correlation between the predicted labels and x2 creeps in, even though x2 is not being used by the model at all. And this is obviously kind of irritating, right? That, that you have a feature that a model doesn't use, but that is still correlated with the outcome, and that actually in the true world is a cause of the outcome. And it already illustrates that if you just look at this model in isolation and interpret this model dependence here, that only tells you something about how relevant that feature is for the model. But you may not make any inferences from that model relevance about the relevance of the feature for the outcome in the real world. So you can only make sense of this if you know the causal structure of the world and the, um, and the model results together. Let me give you one further example. Now imagine that you do an intervention yeah, on X1, on the measurement of X1. So you take a certain value of a patient, you perturb that value and now ask, say if X1 is the age, not of a patient, sorry, of a subject of a defendant. If you take X1 and you change the age, you're kind of asking the model now, what is the model outcome if I change the age from say 50 years to 55 years, or from 18 years to 35 years? And then the model might make a different prediction. However, in the true world, in this case here, if X1 here were the age, Intervening on that one, changing the age, well, first of all, you can't do that. You can't simply change the age of a person by some intervention. And second, it doesn't really have any effect on Y because there is no causal path from X1 to Y. So there's a difference between the effect of interventions on the model level, on the model outcomes, and the effect of interventions on the true outcome when you intervene on the true model variables. And to make things even worse, yeah, here's another example. Imagine you want to simulate what happens if you set the variable x3 to a certain value and study how changing x3 is going to affect your model outcome. And then again, this will not coincide with the outcome that you get when you intervene on the true x3 in the real world. Because if you do that, you're not only changing the outcome, you're also changing x4 because X4 is an effect of X3. So if you change X3 in isolation without changing X4 accordingly, you're kind of putting data into the model that in reality might not exist and might not even be possible. 
So this slide here demonstrates that in order to understand a model, why a model makes certain predictions, you need to be aware that this model, um, or you need to see the model in the context of the causal structure of the variables that generate the data that you're working on. And only when you do that, you can really fully understand the performance of your model. Now, I need to come to a close and have time for questions. So I'm going to cut this short a little bit and say, what we are proposing is that in order to reach kind of the question that you want to ask, and then to pick the right tool for the question, you first need to ask, what is actually the object yet that you want to explain? Do you want to explain the predictions of the model? Do you want to explain actually the true target variable, why? So you know, the prediction would be, is the person likely to commit another crime? The true target variable would be, is the person really going to commit another crime? Or do you want to ask something about their relationships as measured by the loss? And also, on what level do you want this object to be explained? Do you want to have a relationship between, um, so associations, correlations, for instance, between features and those outcome variables, those objects? Do you want to consider the effect of model level intervention? So do you ask how does the model really work? Or do you want to have questions about this world level interventions? If you really uh, do interventions on the real world. And if you do that, then you get this matrix and where you have three different types of things you like to be um, here uh, on the level that you would like to explain and three different objects that you would like to explain. For instance, if you are asking about um, an intervention on the model level and the model outcome, then you might be asking, does a model mechanism rely on gender? Or if you're asking a different question here about um, interventions on the real world and the true outcome variable, you're asking, what can we do to treat a certain disease? And all of these different combinations. And only once you have really settled that question, which, which relationship you want to study, which question you want to answer, then you can ask, what is the best explainable AI method for that particular case? Okay, and now if I had more time, I actually talk about a recent paper of ours that we published at the AAAI conference uh, this year on improvement focused cause regress. And I will briefly say what it's about. Yeah? So it's about recourse recommendations. Yeah, a model needs to be able to tell you you're not admitted, you are not getting a loan. And then you must be able to ask, well, but what can I do about it? And the model must then tell you, well, if you change the following thing about yourself, then you would get a loan. And now the methods that are out there, what they actually do is, they are built such that they can that, they, that you can game them, you can trick them. Now you can change features in the model that actually doesn't change at all whether you're likely to repay a loan or not, but that make the model believe that you're likely to, to repay a loan. And our method is the first one that can at least guarantee, theoretically, uh, and practice is of course always um, with a certain error that the predictions or the recourse recommendations that the model gives you um, translate into a real improvement on the target variable and not only on the predicted variable. But I'm already over time. I should uh, uh, cut this a little bit short. So if you're more interested in that, take a look at this ICR paper. And also there's this wonderful book by Christoph Molina, one of our collaborators in Munich, or he was in Munich at the University of Munich the LMU on um, interpretive machine learning. And we wrote a paper together with Christoph on pitfalls to avoid when interpreting machine learning models that kind of the, the roadmap for which uh, problems to address in research over the next few years. And I would like to point out that the work that I spoke about today is to a large part the work of Gunnar König and Alex Markham uh, to a recent uh, PhD graduates in my book. And uh, now I'm very much looking forward to a few moments of questions. Okay, so let me take a look at the questions that we already have. Could we try to delete input features one by one and see if we get similar results to find redundant features? Yes, you can do that. But there's a difficulty. If you simply delete features, then you're reducing the dimensionality of your feature space, and that may make it easier for the model to learn on limited training data. So instead of deleting features, what you do is you randomly permit them, you shuffle them randomly, thereby destroying the information that they can have about any other variable. 
while keeping the dimensionality of the problem uh, the same. So any difference between structural cosmologists and Bayesian conditional probabilistic trees? Yes. So um, Bayesian conditional probabilistic trees um, are not causal in the sense. So conditional probabilities are not per se causal probabilities. You see, just make certain assumptions to be able to interpret these Bayesian trees uh, from a causal perspective. And the particular assumptions that you make are called the causal Markov condition and the faithfulness assumption. Explaining these would take some time, but in essence, if you're willing to make these two assumptions that are non-testable, then properties of graphs translate into conditional independence relationships, and you can use graphs and graph properties to reason about conditional independencies, and that is the link between these conditional probabilities and these two operators, these causal interventions. So what is the role of sustainability in XAI or vice versa? Interesting. So I'm not sure whether I can answer the question. The way that I see it is that in order to achieve a sustainable AI ecosystem that our society accepts, we need to tackle these problems in XAI. We need to make algorithms transparent. And this transparency is a prerequisite for um, starting a discussion of what fairness actually means in algorithm decision making. And then based on what society decides what fair, what is fair and what is not fair, um, we need to then implement these fairness principles into our algorithms. And I believe only if we do that and take that seriously, algorithmic decision-making, AI-based decision-making um, has and should have a future in our society. There are other questions. You can, of course, also open your mic, uh, but I know that uh, sometimes um, yeah, students find it preferable to just uh, type questions in the chat, whatever you prefer. So if there are no further questions right now, huh? um, let me say a few closing words. Um, explainability, interpretive machine learning, machine learning per se, causality, this is a lot uh, to put into 45 minutes or one hour. So uh, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to pass all of these concepts when you hear about them for the first time. But to those of you who have heard about it for the first time, I hope that I could get you interested in it and think, oh, this is a cool topic and a really relevant topic. And it has this intersection of very challenging, interesting machine learning AI work and at the same time it's societally relevant. So if you're interested in working on this topic, you know, doing a bachelor thesis, a master thesis on the project, you're very welcome to contact us. We always have plenty of projects in this domain of expandable AI uh, with applications in neuroinformatics, but also beyond and also more conceptual work that is independent of specific applications. And I invite you just to send me an email if you're interested. So Mariana, may I give the word back to you then? Yeah, thanks Moritz for your closing words. Um, if you could send the slides to Gerti would be nice. Will do. And yeah, we have also six o'clock. So then also thanks to the audience for the attendance and for the questions. And then I wish all a nice evening. Thank you. And the same to you. Thanks. Bye.